So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you're joining us from. I'm Dr. Megan Wong, a lecturer at Essex Law School, where I'm the founding director of the LLM in International Law degree. Uh, together with Dr. Emily Jones, we are the co-founders and co-conveners of the Public International Law Lecture Series, and we're so pleased to have you join us today. We're delighted to have our speaker, Professor Douglas Guilfoyle, whose lecture is entitled Litigation and Statecraft, Small States and the Law of the Sea. So thank you so much, Douglas, for joining us. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Dr. Jones and I are pleased to um, to have you. And for those of you who have attended our series before, welcome back. As your host, I wanted to speak a little bit more about the public international law lecture series. This lecture series is built upon two important intellectual traditions of public international law, formalism and international legal practice and international legal theory, including post-colonial and feminist perspectives. The idea for this series stems very much first and foremost from our friendship and is inspired from our respect for each other's scholarship and research. Um, Dr. Jones and I are both generalist public international lawyers with several specialist interests, but we engage with international law from different approaches. I'm a formalist and Dr. Jones is a critical legal scholar and this series that we co-founded and co convened together brings forward cutting edge discussions such as our topic today from varied and different frameworks, theory, practice, and what we really hope is something for everyone. And now it is with profound pleasure that I introduce my amazing friend, Dr. Emily Jones, who is also today's chair for this event. Dr. Emily Jones is a NUACT fellow, if I'm saying that right, based in Newcastle Law School, Newcastle University. Um, Emily, as I mentioned, is a general generalist public international lawyer whose interdisciplinary work combines theory and practice. Her work broadly examines modes of resistance and hope, drawing on feminist, queer, post-human, decolonial, and critical disability studies in that aim. Emily's work spans several fields of international law, including international environmental law, the law of the sea, international human rights law, science, technology, and international law, international disarmament law, and outer space law, amongst others. And Emily's monograph, Feminist Theory and International Law, Post-Human Perspectives, was published with Routledge's Glasshouse series in um, 2023. And she's also the co-author of The Law of War and Peace, A Gender Analysis, Volume 1, published in 2021 by Bloomsbury. And she has co-edited two volumes, International Law and Posthuman Theory, um, with Routledge and the more posthuman glossary, again, with Bloomsbury. Um, and with that, I leave the, um, the floor, so to speak, to um, Dr. Jones and Pro Professor Guilfoyle. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. It's a pleasure as always to be here with you today. And thank you to everyone who's signed in as well. I know it's a little bit early for those of you that are in the UK, but we have quite an international audience as well. So hopefully this time works for lots of people. Um, it is my real pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Professor Douglas Guilfoyle. Professor Guilfoyle joined UNSW Canberra in 2018 and is presently an Australian Research Council, Council Future Fellow. He is also a visiting fellow at the Sea Power Centre, which is in Australia, and is the 2024 Lieber Scholar at West Point. His principal areas of research are maritime security, the international law of the sea, and international and transnational criminal law. His current future fellowship project examines the use by small states of strate strategic law of the sea litigation against great powers, of which we'll hear a lot more of today. Professor Guilfoyle was previously a professor of law at Monash University and a reader at law at University College London, and has worked as a judicial associate in the Australian Federal Court and the Australian Administrative Appeals Tribunal, and has also practiced as a commercial litigation solicitor in Sydney. Now today, of course, he will be speaking to the title, as Dr Wong mentioned, of Litigation as Statecraft, Small States and the Law of the Sea. And just a very few quick housekeeping things before we begin. If you want to ask a question, you can ask a question at any point. There's like a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. 
Um, you can ask them at any time, but I'll be putting them to Professor Guilfoyle at the end of his lecture. Um, and you can also choose to remain anonymous when asking your question. There's a little tick box that you can click if you wish to do this. Um, so please do do that if you don't want me to read your name out, because otherwise I probably will. Um, so that is it for me. Without further ado, thank you, Professor Guilfoyle, for jo joining us and over to you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. And many thanks to Drs Jones and Wong for the invitation to participate in a really excellent series. All right, so um, my topic this evening is litigation of statecraft, small states and the law of the sea. And this project that I'm working on currently really starts from a single question, which is why litigate if you can't win? That is, you know, we're all um, familiar as public international lawyers and in terms of the traditions that have been spoken about this evening, I probably come more out of the formalist and practitioner oriented side, though um, certainly theory informs my work. Uh, but we're all familiar with that kind of critique put to us often by uh, lay people or occasionally um, political scientists or IR scholars that, you know, what difference does international law really make, and particularly international litigation or dispute settlement? The idea that the ultimately the strong will do what they want and the weak will suffer what they must. Um, and if one takes that view that uh, power is the principal determinant of international affairs, then at best, litigation should only be attractive to similarly situated states. If you have roughly equal levels of power in the international system, then you might think that litigation is the most efficient way to resolve your problems. And essentially, if we sort of subscribe to that realist intuition, then we should expect that litigation across any significant asymmetry of power should be doomed to fail and may ultimately backfire politically, that it should be counterproductive. Uh, the difficulty with that intuition, of course, is that we sort of see um, what I would call small or smaller state litigation or litigation across a significant asymmetry of power happening all the time, particularly in the law of the sea. Um, so we've had a series of proceedings uh, between Mauritius and the UK. Uh, we've certainly um, had in the news for quite some time now, the Philippines uh, against China arbitration, um, the Timor-Leste Australia maritime boundary conciliation. Prior to uh, the present invasion and war, Ukraine had launched a series of it loss proceedings against Russia regarding uh, events in the Black Sea. And more recently, in terms of advisory jurisdiction, we've seen the Council of Small Island States. Um, sorry, we've seen a push through the General Assembly led by small island states for an ICJ advisory opinion on the obligation of states in respect of climate change. And also the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law has sought a similar advisory opinion from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So, you know, if immediate compliance is not on the table, if small states don't realistically expect that simply gaining an international tribunal judgment or advisory opinion will automatically change the behaviour of greater powers, why do they engage in these international dispute settlement processes? So that for me is the question. The question that's often put to us as lawyers is why would great powers comply with international law? Looking at what actually goes on in the field of litigation, dispute settlement and advisory opinions, I think the question for us uh, as lawyers or scholars of international courts and tribunals is, well, if all of that's true, why don't small states capitulate without ever invoking the law? So this brings me again to my, my sort of core question. Why do small states litigate? And here we've got a few definitional hurdles we sort of need to clear. So the first is which states are small? Um, now, from a theoretical perspective, most efforts at defining small states have sort of run into the sand. There's no obvious line above or below which um, states are to be considered small. There's a reasonably common definition uh, of small states between um, UN and World Bank documentation. But again, these lines are a little artificial. For the purposes of my project, I'm really using small as shorthand for asymmetry of power. So small in relation to the respondent state. 
And also I'm using litigation in a very broad sense to really encompass dispute settlement in general and advisory opinions. So not in a strictly technically accurate sense, I'm but um, simply as a shorthand for a wider set of legal mechanisms. So within that very broad sense of litigation, how do international dispute settlement or legal proceedings help small states get what they want? That's the point I need to come to. And that really brings me to a further question of what do we understand the role of international law and litigation to be in international politics? And hopefully in the next sort of 25 minutes or so, I'll answer um, at least some of that. Now, a further preliminary question before I kind of get into the mechanics of how this might work is, why do we see so many of these cases occurring under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? And I think there are a number of factors here. The first is that part 15 of the Law of the Sea Convention contains a uh, compulsory dispute settlement system that I'll say a little bit more about in a moment that can result in cases going to the International Court of Justice, to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or if parties to the convention haven't chosen any other mechanism in advance, to international arbitration, which is why many of these cases do wind up as arbitrations. Uh, but the important point here is, despite a number of exceptions, it's compulsory. Now, you couple that with the reach of the convention, having 169 parties, and suddenly this is a dispute settlement system which for small states has a lot to recommend it. If you want to challenge the policies of a large state and you want them to have to come uh, to the proceedings, then you need a compulsory system and you need one that most states are party to. And other than the World Trade Organization, it's hard to think of many treaties with this kind of reach and a compulsory dispute settlement system. There may also be a sense of ownership or investment on the part of a number of small states, particularly small island states, in that uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, negotiated as it was between 1973 and 1982, was the first major multilateral convention involving a lot of recently decolonized states, and a lot of small island jurisdictions were beneficiaries of innovations of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, such as the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. All right, so I don't want for the purposes of this talk to get bogged down in the technicalities of how uh, law of the sea dispute settlement works. It is a very technical field, but very briefly, um, there is an obligation to exchange views first, but once that has been done, any dispute concerning interpretation or application of the convention is subject to compulsory dispute resolution. So that's the sort of attractive gateway to the system. Um, However, that is complicated by a series of automatic exclusions from the scope of dispute settlement, uh, particularly to do with marine scientific research and fisheries management, uh, but is also in a sense balanced by a series of automatic inclusions. Uh, there are certain things which are always within the scope of uncross dispute settlement, particularly questions of environmental protection and freedom of navigation. Uh, there are then under Article 298, a series of optional exclusions that um, by declaration, states can say they uh, are excluding from their disputes under the convention. These include sea boundary delimitation, uh, matters of law enforcement or military activities or whether security council is active. Now that series of exclusions and inclusions mean there's a great deal that turns in law of the sea disputes on how they are characterized. So there are very frequently debates over um, whether a dispute is really within or without the convention for the purposes of dispute settlement. So this is a system that's ripe for debates about jurisdiction and also ripe for um, applicants to engage in clever characterization of the facts. That is, you know, if you can't bring all of your dispute under the convention, maybe you can at least bring a part of your dispute under the convention. All right. So I've obviously framed this talk in terms of legal statecraft. Why am I not using terms more widely understood in the literature, such as lawfare or strategic litigation? Well, my essential point here is I'm not sure those terms are terribly helpful. Neither sort of body of literature really tells us what makes litigation either strategic or lawfare, though there are some useful threads I can bring out. Um, the strategic litigation literature that largely, but not exclusively, arises in a human rights context will talk about strategic litigation as having a number of characteristics, that usually it's um, 
the litigation is seeking a long-term impact beyond the immediate subject matter of the dispute, uh, that's attempting to use law as a mechanism for social change. And often the individual legal case will be part of a wider campaign of um, both legal and other measures. Um, lawfare, the lawfare literature is now wide and diverse and there are uh, many definitions and indeed taxonomies of different ways that um, lawfare can be used. But essentially this is about the instrumental use of the law to achieve strategic ends that might otherwise require the use of other instruments of power. And essentially my problem with the lawfare is that boiling it right down, it tends to suggest the instrumental use of the law can affect politics and that's bad when bad guys do it. I mean, at their best, um, lawfare academics, including Kittry, who I put up um, here on the slide, the cover of his famous book, will say, we acknowledge that our guys do lawfare as well. But nonetheless, the term always has this sense of the improper use of the law. So it starts out from a kind of pejorative context. So I'm attracted to the idea of legal statecraft for a number of reasons. The first is that both the lawfare and strategic litigation literatures accept that law can change or at least put pressure on politics. But both fail to explain how and where the boundary with ordinary lawyering is. That is, it's very difficult to draw a line and say, well, this is the ordinary conduct of international dispute settlement as lawyers in foreign uh, offices or departments of external affairs would do it. And here is the additional layer that is clearly lawfare or strategic litigation. That boundary really isn't able to be drawn plausibly or consistently. Uh, whereas statecraft is a term commonly used in the international relations and political studies literature to talk about the levers of power that states have available to them in pursuing their national interest. And that literature will commonly talk about things like uh, military statecraft, hard power, um, soft power, cultural statecraft, diplomatic statecraft, uh, increasingly economic statecraft, using trade to influence international relations. But only occasionally will it touch on the idea of legal statecraft. And that's um, what I'm interested in, the extent to which the legal instrument of statecraft can be used to pursue either national or collective policy goals. All right, so with that sort of ground clearing out of the way, the question then is, well, in that sort of framework, what can international courts do to assist small states? Why are they a place to put legal arguments in the hope of influencing politics? And a lot of the recent literature on international courts and tribunals points to a number of effects that international courts can generate. The first is that they obviously produce authoritative statements of law and fact, and these can be very difficult to walk back, even for great powers. They tend to cohere into social facts that are just accepted. So for example, in terms of um, my case studies for the broader project, uh, the South China Sea dispute, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam have all in government statements on record referred to the South China Sea Arbitration Award as setting out the law which defines the extent of their waters and their maritime resources that has become a common touch point for the region in terms of how one understands the application of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Also, at least symbolically, appearing before an international court or tribunal levels the playing field. So they become for it for smaller states to challenge the legitimacy of a more powerful state's actions, to say your actions are not in conformity with the law, and possibly even to challenge the legitimacy or influence of the state itself. If you frame your arguments in the right way, you can also use international court and tribunal decisions to mobilize a supportive constituency. So for example, um, Benedict Kingsbury has suggested that the reason smaller states build dispute settlement procedures into major treaties is not because they think it will magically induce compliance by greater powers, but that if they ever get a judgment in their favor, it will become a sort of standard others may rally around and what they can't achieve on their own in terms of generating political pressure, they might be able to achieve with a group of like-minded states. And we can see that in the South China Sea context I was just uh, mentioning. 
And so all of these effects cumulatively can mean that international courts and their decisions can be a mechanism for generating pressure for legal or political change. Now, if you're going to use international courts to try and push for change, the question then is what sort of arguments are effective to put to international courts or tribunals to get the result you want? How do you go about making effective arguments? Um, and here I draw on the work of um, Kong Yang Kai, who wrote a very interesting book on um, China and the international legal order. Now, he suggests that um, for his purposes, lawfare, he thinks moves along three axes. I'm only interested in two of these. So two dyads um, that he puts up that you find elsewhere in literature as well is a distinction that's often made, at least rhetorically, between legal and political disputes or between legal and non-legal disputes or between justiciable and non-justiciable disputes, but I'll stick with legal political for simplicity, and between individual and community interest. So if you're interested in pressuring a state, if you're interested in trying to challenge the legitimacy of its actions and challenge them on the basis that their actions are not in conformity with law, then obviously the dispute has to be legally framed. That's just a given if you're going into a court or tribunal. Um, and to mobilize a supportive constituency, it's particularly helpful if you use international law to frame your grievance as an attack on a collective interest, something that international law is actually quite well suited to, as scholars such as Marty Koskinyemi have noted. But if you're a respondent, if you're a greater power being targeted by these sorts of legal proceedings, you might um, think about the kind of arguments that you would find uh, that should be effective in resisting. So in terms of resisting this lawfare, if you're on the receiving end, um, first thing you're going to want to do is to recast the dispute as being political. This is somehow motivated by concerns outside the relevant legal framework. Uh, and if it's not nakedly political, it's at least ill-conceived. It's non-justiciable. It shouldn't be brought under this treaty. The problem really belongs to a different body of law and has been shoehorned into this treaty for political reasons. Also, if you want to resist the risk of this case becoming a standard around which others may rally, you're going to want to insist that the dispute is very strictly bilateral, that this isn't actually something that involves a community interest. So that's what the theory um, would tell us. And the result would look something like this. So in the first quadrant, you've got the strongest argument for applicants. We have a legal dispute here involving a community interest. And in the fourth quadrant, you've got the strongest argument for respondents. This is ultimately a political or non-justiciable dispute, which is strictly bilateral. Now, this logically creates a couple of other categories. Um, quadrant three, we have, uh, you might retort by saying this dispute genuinely involves a community interest that is ultimately non-justiciable. And in some of the nuclear weapons advisory opinions, that was the attitude of the nuclear weapons holding states. Yep, we accept there's a community interest in nuclear weapons, but it's not uh, ultimately a justiciable issue. Um, and on an applicant, the applicant side, you might say, uh, yes, we accept this is purely bilateral, but I'm not entirely sure why you do that. And I can't think of an obvious case where it's been done. All right. So the question then becomes, do states in fact argue this way? So if we look to one of my case studies, which I'll come back to in more detail, um, the Mauritius UK uh, dispute and their first UN convention under the law of the sea arbitration, the Attorney General of Mauritius, Attorney General Darby, opened by saying in those proceedings, uh, there is not a single African state that recognizes the lawfulness of what the United Kingdom has done. The African position has been endorsed by the non-aligned movement, the group of 77 and China, and the Africa South American summit. On the other hand, the United Kingdom is asking you to maintain a colonial status quo, a use of the convention that its negotiators surely never intended. So there's an immediate appeal here to the multilateral and to two legal standards, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and also the Law on Decolonization. Um, conversely, uh, Attorney General Grieve of the UK in the same proceedings responded by saying, it is the Mauritian claim to sovereignty over the disputed islands that is the real issue in and behind the current proceedings. 
the claim to sovereignty has been put forward here in the guise of a case under UNCLOS. And that dispute as to sovereignty, however it is cast or recast, is not a dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the convention at all. So here the um, framing is cast as bilateral. This is only about sovereignty. No one else needs to get alarmed. This is not a multilateralizable dispute. And also it is politically motivated. It's been brought under the guise of UNCLOS and that this is not really a dispute concerning the convention. It is in some sense an abusive process. Uh, similarly, in the South China Sea arbitration, while China didn't formally appear, it did release a position paper on the issues. And in that position paper, it said the Philippines is well aware that the tribunal established under the convention has no jurisdiction over territorial sovereignty disputes. So again, we're in quadrant four, this is non-justiciable. In an attempt to circumvent this jurisdictional hurdle and fabricate a basis for institution of arbitral proceedings, the Philippines has cunningly packaged its case in the present form. So again, a sense that this is uh, an abuse of rights, it's somehow a politically motivated use of the convention. Um, also, if we look at recent proceedings before the International Tribunal for the Sea and the Council of Small Island States request for an advisory opinion, uh, Prime Minister Gaston Brown of Antigua and Barbuda opened those proceedings by saying, the political process must be informed by existing binding obligations under international law. I emphasize existing obligations. We have not come before you to create new law. All that we ask is for the tribunal to clarify what UNCLOS requires of state parties. They went on to say, this is the opening chapter in the struggle to change the conduct of the international community by clarifying the obligation of states to protect the marine environment. So this goes to some of those characteristics of strategic litigation I outlined on an earlier slide. There's a very self-conscious understanding here that this case is part of a broader campaign and that part of the aim here is to have politics, um, the acceptable boundaries of what can re be regarded as a political solution or the frame of political discussion, uh, what's sometimes called the Overton window, framed in terms of the law as opposed to what seems to be politically possible or pragmatic. Um, and he foreshadows that there will be other cases in other fora, um, something that becomes important when we turn to our case study. So I want to spend my um, remaining time looking in slightly more detail at a case study. Uh, so I'd like to speak um, with you briefly about the Mauritius UK proceedings. I think it's quite instructive. So these concern whether um, the United Kingdom or Mauritius is sovereign over the Chagos archipelago, including Diego Garcia, the site of a um, famous or infamous US Air Force base uh, that was used in operations in Afghanistan and the global war on terror. Um, to put this very, very briefly, um, prior to independence, while still formally a colony, the pre-independence Mauritian ministers were essentially coerced into accepting the excision of the Chagos archipelago from the territory of Mauritius for the purposes of decolonization in 1965. That was done so that part of the archipelago could become a US base. Uh, proceedings relating to the archipelago when the United Kingdom unilaterally declared a marine protected area uh, around the archipelago as an ostensible conservation measure um, first began in 2010 uh, in UNCLOS arbitration proceedings, were followed up by an International Court of Justice advisory opinion, the legal consequences of the decolonization of Mauritius in 2018, and were further explored in a maritime boundary dispute it lost between Mauritius and the Maldives um, in a preliminary objections case in 2021. So that's the broad framework. I just want to go very quickly through how some of that played out. So in 2015, that UNCLOS arbitral tribunal held that Mauritius enjoyed certain rights in the archipelago under the law of the sea convention, and the UK was bound by what were called the Lancaster House undertakings. So certain uh, unilateral undertakings given by the UK as to the status of the archipelago to the pre-independence uh, ministers. Therefore, the UK had at the least a duty to consult with Mauritius before doing anything that unilaterally affected the archipelago. Uh, 
However, two of the five arbitrators dissented and held that the UK's violation of the law of decolonization meant it was not the relevant coastal state under UNCLOS and would have found that they could have made a determination about sovereignty over the whole islands under the convention. Now, in a sense, that at one level, fairly small technical win, but with a strong dissent, put wind in Mauritius's sails and allowed them to push forward at the UN General Assembly uh, for a referral to the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on that broader question of decolonization. The ICJ then in turn held that the UK's continued administration of what it called its British Indian Ocean Territory was in violation of international law and must be brought to an end. Then when uh, Mauritius was able to say, well, these islands are plainly ours. It initiated a maritime boundary dispute with the Maldives, where, of course, the Maldives' objection was, well, the UK also claims it owns this archipelago, and we don't want to get into that dispute. Nonetheless, Mauritius was able to, to argue that the EEZ around the Chagos archipelago belonged to it, not the UK. And it lost in hearing that dispute, ultimately held that the IC, ICJ advisory opinions, despite being advisory, have legal effect and rendered the UK's claim to sovereignty as being a mere assertion. Um, the question that the realist can fairly ask though is, has the UK regained the islands in light of all of this? Well, following all of these proceedings, there's been a strong degree of institutional recognition for the Mauritian claim. The UN world map now reflects it as sovereign over the disputed archipelago, as does the Food and Agriculture Organization map, the Universal Postal Union, and so on. We've seen Mauritian delegations visit the archipelago and raise flags. And all of these proceedings, have cumulative, which have cumulatively implicated the uh, UK in being in violation of the law of decolonization, have definitely damaged its soft power. For the first time ever in 2018 in ICJ elections, um, a sitting incumbent UK judge at the International Court of Justice, Sir Christopher Greenwood, was not returned, and there was not a UK judge on the ICJ. And in International Criminal Court elections in 2021, uh, the UK's strong preference would have been to have uh, its candidate, Kareem Khan, elected as prosecutor, uh, but elected unopposed. But there was an opposed vote. Now, one of the risks of this kind of litigation, though, is that certain issues get pushed out, pushed out of the picture. The Chagossians, the original inhabitants who were displaced from these islands to make way for the US air base, have had a largely symbolic role, but really the applicant remains Mauritius. These cases are not ultimately about securing a right of return for the Chagossians. In any event, the ultimate Mauritian aim is to bring the UK back to the negotiating table. And after all of these proceedings, it was announced in late 2022 that negotiations about the eventual handover of the Chagos Islands would be uh, resumed. So we can see here a sort of cycle. Negotiations weren't working for Mauritius, a campaign of various legal proceedings allied with um, other uh, institutional changes and recognition, for example, the UN world map, have put pressure on the UK to the point where it had to come back to the negotiating table. And this is how, indirectly at least, um, legal statecraft can help smaller states uh, secure concessions. Uh, I also want before closing just to kind of say that it doesn't only have to be litigation in terms of small states. There are other forms of legal statecraft that small states engage in. And one of those is norm entrepreneurship. So Tuvalu has been a, a, another small island state that's been very significant in looking at the existential risks of climate change and campaigning for a principle of continuity of statehood and permanent, permanent maritime boundaries, even if all of its land territory becomes submerged. But its statehood should remain recognized and it should retain its economically valuable exclusive economic zone. So part of that does have, in my sense, a litigation aspect. Uh, it was one of the two founders of the Council of Small Island States on International Law and Climate Change, and they sought uh, the International Law of the Sea Tribunal advisory opinion um, that is presently underway. But in addition, uh, their constitution, uh, their revised constitution of 2023, has proclaimed their permanent sovereignty even if they lose their territory. 
And that legal position has been picked up in a 2023 declaration, a common declaration by the Pacific Island Forum governance. And there is, with a bit of an asterisk against it, presently a treaty being uh, negotiated or renegotiated between uh, Tuvalu and Australia that would couple various elements, but these include Australia continuing to recognise the ongoing statehood of Tuvalu, but also providing a climate migration pathway for resettlement of the Tuvaluan population in Australia. But returning to the question of litigation or dispute settlement or advisory opinions of statecraft, obviously it's not without risk. Strategic or instrumental use of the law may change the law itself. Um, it may also dilute the kind of arguments you can put. Squeezing things into a legal frame can push others out of the picture. So I mentioned the status of the original inhabitants of the Chagos archipelago, the Chagossians, not necessarily having their interests front and center in all of these proceedings. Uh, there are certainly concerns that it might push greater powers to leave dispute settlement systems if they feel that they're, uh, it's constantly being invoked against them and people may have questions about those. Uh, but also there's a risk for tribunals. The legitimacy, not just of great powers is on the line in these cases, but also the tribunals themselves. And I call this the Southwest Africa risk. Obviously the ICJ had very few cases brought to it, um, particularly by developing um, states after uh, its very poorly received decisions in the Southwest Africa cases. Um, finally, just as a brief observation, uh, these cases are ultimately argued, despite the fact I've talked about a variety of small states, they're argued by a relatively small group of people. Um, so uh, on this slide, I've just gotten the top band. Um, I've just gotten the top band judges or arbitrators, then uh, lawyers for uh, senior lawyers, not the entire legal team for applicants, then in the bottom, um, senior lawyers for respondents. And I've put in bold anyone who appeared twice. So, you know, in an unscientific way, this slide just gives you a sense that if certain types of cases are argued at the international level, there's a reasonably small group of people, most of many of whom have about a 50-50 chance of appearing in uh, any given case. Um, and the implications of that may be worth reflecting on. Uh, but I will leave it there. And I'll just say that um, this presentation is based on an article of the same name with the 2023 British Yearbook of International Law. And if you don't have access to it, please just contact me by uh, email or Twitter, and I'll do my best to get you a copy. But I think that's my time and I will leave it there. Fabulous, thank you so much, Professor Gilfoyle for that um, very fascinating and detailed, but also very clear and accessible lecture, which um, I personally really appreciated as well. Um, we have quite a few questions that are coming in, so I would be keen to get started on those because we have around 20 minutes for the Q&A, um, providing you're feeling not too bad with your cold. Um, great. <laughs> um, so I will start off with this question from Arpan Chakravarti, um, who thanks you for your um, presentation. Um, they're from India. And they have a quick question that, although not related to small states, perhaps pertains to states in general. So the question is, considering the UN stalemate over the ongoing conflicts across the globe, do you believe this would lead to an increase in the number of litigations brought to the ICJ? So I think kind of a broader question about, you know, do we see kind of small states or global south states bringing more litigation to um, ICJ, but also other courts? And what do you kind of think about that in the context of your talk? And also, do you think that legal measures will find more prominence in statecraft across the globe? So quite a big one to start off with. but. I'll leave, start with that one. Um, yes, thank you. That's a fascinating question. And um, I guess my very short pithy answer is yes. Right. Uh, I think we've entered a unique age where we're seeing what I've sort of started thinking of as the um, judicialization of active conflicts. Right. We've never seen this, or we've very seldom seen this before. The, the closest analogue I could think of would be uh, the 1986 Nicaragua case, where Nicaragua argued about US financing and support of rebels operating across its border. 
Um, but that, as, as it were, was a sort of non-declared uh, proxy conflict. And now we've seen multiple proceedings, um, you know, Ukraine and Russia, uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, um, South Africa, Israel, you know, all um, implicating you know, present either active wars or cross-border crises where in real time, as one aspect of diplomacy or statecraft, seeking to inject international law into the proceedings to um, pressure one side or the other uh, is an actual feature of what's going on. Um, and occasionally this is alluded to very directly. There's quite a pithy quote from one of Ukraine's ambassadors at large who was asked, well, why is Ukraine bringing so many international legal proceedings when there's no realistic prospect that uh, they're going to change Russian behavior in the short term. And his answer was, and, and I paraphrase, but I'm, I'm fairly close to his words, I think, um, uh, even though those words had a slightly old fashioned cast, but they're essentially, one day Russia will seek to rejoin the family of civilized nations. And when they do, the price of readmission will be compliance with each and every judgment we've secured against them. Um, so there's that twofold element of diplomatic pressure, but also, in a sense, stockpiling things that could be invoked in the future. So I think this is something we are only going to see more of. Um, and there will be a question about whether it does, as I put in one of my last questions in the slide, prompt certain states to leave conventions with compulsory dispute settlement clauses. Um, but it would be a very big deal for a state to leave the genocide convention, right? Um, it might not be as big a deal to leave the law of the sea convention, but states seem fairly reluctant to do it. And certainly of uh, a number of states that have threatened to leave the uh, International Criminal Court, only one or two have ever gone through with it. Um, so it, yeah, it's a definite trend and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Definitely. Thank you very much for that answer. So I'm actually going to ask a couple of questions that lead on from that a little bit that um, have both come in from anonymous attendees that are kind of around the sort of success of small states in these disputes. Um, so the first one notes that Mauritius in UK seems to be, as you said, a successful example of litigation as statecraft. However, the person argues that you cannot necessarily say the same for other case studies such as the South China Sea. They say what China is doing on the ground and even the attitude of other claimants towards the SCS arbitral award seems to show that the Philippine statecraft is not really working. So how do you account for the differences in these two case studies? And that also leads on to another question that's, I think, very similar, which is again from an anonymous attendee that asks, what are the probabilities of the results of small states in these disputes, seeing as they are deemed to be weaker than their opponents? So yeah, I guess a question about the kind of politics around this and success and likelihood of success. Right, yeah, so I mean, I'm not making, so I mean, my interest in sort of doing this um, project, it's a four year project notionally and I'm two years in, uh, is not to claim that this works all the time or that there are guaranteed successes. And if we just sort of step back and think about this as lawyers in our domestic systems, you know, it's something any competent barrister or courtroom attorney will always advise their clients is if you can avoid it don't go to court right the results will be uncertain so even in the national system um, we only usually go to litigation to some extent uh, as a final roll of the dice or certainly not with um, expectations at least for large players, you know, repeat actors such as government departments or corporations or businesses who are familiar with the law, uh, you know, will accept that they'll win some and lose some. Um, so I make no claims that the law is magic. I'd push back a bit on the idea that there has been no result in the South China Sea context at all. Um, and I do that on a couple of fronts. So in my paper, I make a more detailed argument that one of the things that small states can get against greater powers out of a judicial process is what I call a legitimacy penalty. And that this harms the soft power of 
the greater state in other fora or other proceedings, right? And that the only way for them, in a sense, to cure the legitimacy problem is to come back to the table. So um, a, possibly the best example of this, though it wasn't my worked example, uh, or the best example other than Mauritius UK, is East Timor Australia. So, you know, East Timor initiated several international cases against Australia, then uh, a compulsory maritime boundary conciliation process under um, Article 298.1A1, which featured very briefly on one of my earlier slides against Australia. And essentially, the pressure of the other cases brought Australia into the conciliation proceeding. That proceeding was then constructively engaged with. And in my estimation, in terms of where the final maritime boundary was put, Timor Leste got about 80% of what it wanted compared to the starting point. Now, if we think about the South China Sea dispute, I think there are several kind of indicia that um, at least even if things haven't gotten better, one of the features of the law is that for states other than China, they haven't gotten any worse, right? There has been this galvanizing effect where, as I quoted before, numerous states in the region have quoted the arbitral award and said, no, we are promised a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone under the convention, and we are not going to compromise on that because China is simply a bigger state that has made a, an argument not recognized under the convention that it has peculiar historic rights across the entirety of the South China Seas. And I do think that has put China consistently on the back foot in terms of presenting itself as being the legitimate claimant to these waters. And I think the Philippines in particular has kind of piggybacked off that and is now running an amazing social media campaign, putting out footage of the altercations between Chinese Coast Guard and Philippines Coast Guard vessels and between um, Chinese vessels and Philippines fishermen. And all of that is sort of a public diplomacy that is about uh, legality in a way. Um, so, I think, you know, I wouldn't call that compliance and I wouldn't call it a full win. Uh, and one might think that it's from certain points of view, that's actually a bad thing that law has in a sense kind of frozen the contours of that conflict. But law has also kind of kept it below the level of open conflict. So I think the South China Seas is a complex case but, and I don't think it's a complete win, but I also don't think it's an example of a great power just completely ignoring the law and it having no influence on politics either. Fabulous, thank you very much for your answer to that question. Um, yeah, we get, we, we're getting lots of questions coming in now as well, so it's now getting difficult to choose, but I wanted to ask, um, I'm gonna try and pick a few based on themes, but I wanted to ask first this question from Larry Maugsu, who's of course a friend of the series, um, who asks, international courts and tribunals usually frame their judgments in purely technical terms like it's only about the interpretation of the law. Do you think judges are at the same time intuitively aware of this power asymmetry and the statecraft aspects that make small states take major powers to international courts? And do you think that the courts themselves feel power asymmetry, like that of their institutions are less powerful than the UN Security Council or its permanent members, for example? So I guess a question about how judges are viewing these cases, if you have any insight around that. Um. Yes, thank you, Laurie. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think the psychology of benches um, varies a great deal. In terms of full disclosure, I was a um, junior legal advisor to the Mauritian team in the very first of those cases I mentioned. I've had no subsequent involvement in any of the other uh, elements of the Mauritian proceedings. So all of my, everything I say about, as it were, the course of those proceedings is an academic hypothesis, but it was interesting to watch both the arbitrators in the room and senior counsel's interaction with them. Um, I don't think, I mean, you know, uh, I, I guess from uh, an Australian or UK perspective, you'd kind of say, you know, is there any sympathy for the underdog, right? You know, should we, should we help out the, the little guy here who's clearly been wronged? I think inside the courtroom or the negotiating room, um, the formality of proceedings and formal equality does have a levelling effect. And, you know, if you've got 
uh, several of the great international lawyers of the day representing either side, going to my last slide about the limited number of people who do this in practice, uh, I think that probably gives the judges some comfort that there's in the courtroom or the hearing room or the negotiating room um, an equality of arms that there isn't in the real world. So that may decrease uh, any sort of judicial um, receptiveness to uh, we're the wrong small party kind of arguments. But on the flip side, I, I would kind of underline the thing I said about the Southwest Africa cases. I do think, and this is something I sort of learned from watching um, much more uh, senior international barristers who actually argue cases, was that you know you could put arguments where you could see that the point was getting the decision makers to think about the impact on future cases. You know, do you want more cases coming to your court or tribunal or fewer? Do you want to alienate the global South or do you want them to think well of your institution? And even when it's an ad hoc arbitration, those arbitrators are likely to be judges of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, judges of the International Court of Justice. And sometimes those arguments might actually play differently to uh, an ICJ judge than to a Law of the Sea Tribunal judge. Their institutional interests might not be entirely aligned. So there are a number of factors at play there, and I'm not sure it's as straightforward as kind of sympathy for the underdog or not. And, and in terms of the things that, you know, law as a discipline brings to proceedings, I do actually think the potential for the formality of proceedings and the ability to retain outside counsel as a levelling effect is a positive. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Professor Guilfoyle. So I kind of actually, we have a question that's come in from an anonymous attendee that speaks a little bit more about who these people involved are. So I thought that that was an important question to ask considering your final slide. So the attendee asks, um, they say, all the arbitrators on the table that you showed were men and mostly white. So to what extent do you think this does have an impact on the outcome of the cases? And do you think that states should bear this in mind when they're using litigation as, as a statecraft, for example, by not nominating women arbitrators? So I guess, yeah, just asking you to expand a little bit more on those final um, points that you made. Yeah, no, I, I think in, in short, um, yes, states uh, should bear in mind questions of gender and representation uh, more widely. I mean, one way of dealing with that actually would just be to send more cases to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and not arbitration. Like one of the reasons it has, and again, gender representation there isn't amazing, but uh, it never is on international tribunals, but it's um, not the worst. Uh, but one of the reasons for having a much bigger bench at it lost than the ICJ was to have wider representation of the legal systems of the world and national states. One of the, the reasons though, that when the stakes are high, states tend to go to arbitration is that in choosing the arbitrators, I guess they feel they have more control over proceedings. And then the default is always, the default attraction is always to go to people with a track record. And of course, in a limited system uh, where institutional power accrues in a particular way, that's going to be a small number of people which tend again to be uh, white and male and from the global north. Um, so uh, my late PhD supervisor, James Crawford said, he was often asked, how do you get to argue a case in front of the International Court of Justice? And he, his reply was always, it's terribly easy. You just have to have done it once before. But the problem is if you want someone with experience, you can have some confidence in those sort of networks of power and referral tend to narrow the pool. The only thing I kind of say is, you know, if you look across uh, that slide, uh, you know, there are um, up and coming women in the ranks. And if you look actually at the representation of, uh, you know, gender and people's country of origin in recent proceedings before the ICJ, in, for example, the New Palestine Advisory opinion, um, you know, it's quite strikingly more diverse than it has been in the past. In part, that's a function of just how many speaking slots there were but that's given an enormous number of people their first appearance in front of an international tribunal, which, uh, or if not their first, you know, has bolstered their CV substantially. Um, and uh, according to the James Crawford axiom, that's what counts. You know, once you've got that foot in the door, it's much easier to keep doing it again. Yeah, so hopefully things will be changing slowly and incrementally over time as well. Um, thank you for that.
I am aware of the time. We have more questions, but I just don't think we're going to have time to get through them. So I think we'll have to end there, I'm afraid. But I'm sure you're very happy for people to email you questions if um, they would like to. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we have questions on fragmentation in international law, um, questions on kind of, yeah, lawfare, et cetera. So yeah, please do email Professor Gilfoyle if you would like him to answer your question. I'm sorry, I couldn't possibly get through all of them. Um, but just to say thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Professor Gilfoyle for that fantastic lecture. It really was a pleasure to listen to you and I've learned a lot today, so thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you everyone for attending and your enthusiasm. Wonderful. Have a good day, evening, wherever in the world you are. Um, thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye.